I'm Robert Clifford and welcome to the Chicago Bar Association's Justice and Law Weekly. We are honored to welcome Illinois State Senate President John Cullerton uh, as our guest. Senator Cullerton is a Chicago native, became president of the Illinois Senate in January of 2009. Uh, Senator Cullerton has been a champion for persons of mental illness uh, and other causes during his 31 year tenure in the Illinois General Assembly. He has been praised for fighting for causes that other legislators avoid and his successful ability to pass legislation is a measure of his ability to collaborate with people. Uh, welcome Senator Cullerton, thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much for inviting me. You know there's something that uh, I, I think I told you before the program I would mention and that is uh, at the risk of being patronizing to you that how proud and happy we are on behalf of the Chicago Bar to have you. The fact that you've been in our uh, government for 31 years is just a testament to your uh, professionalism, your integrity, your honor, and the for service you've given well, the people. Thank you, and it's uh, obviously been fun, but uh, I have to submit my name to the to the people in my district, so I, I should thank them for electing me. There uh, we go. And my colleagues for electing me president of the Senate back in uh, January of '09. There you go. And, and speaking of that, how do uh, you know? I'm, I want to talk about several things this evening, or today rather, particularly how government works, but. How does someone become president of the Illinois Senate? Actually, the Senate president is extremely humbling experience because you have to get elected by your colleagues. So there's 59 state senators. You need 30 votes to become the president of the Senate. So uh, in our case, uh, back in January of 2009, we have 37 Democrats, so I needed 30 votes. Uh, and I had to get 37 Democrats to, uh, uh, to come together and, right. and have at least 30 of them support me. And that's what we did. Actually, we had a caucus. and. Uh, other candidates ran, and I was uh, ahead, and we all kind of decided to consolidate, not have a fight on the floor. So uh, on the day of the election, Republicans voted for Republicans, Democrats voted for me, and um, got to be elected. Okay. In that process, could you tell us, uh, generally speaking, what the relationship is between you as the leader uh, of the Senate and how you interact with the leader of the House as well as the governor? Yeah. Well. Uh, most people uh, should know this, but uh, it bears repeating. You cannot pass a law unless an identical law passes out of both chambers, both the House and the Senate. Then it goes to the governor. The governor can either veto it, or in Illinois, mandatorily veto it, or sign it. And if the governor mandatorily vetoes it, it comes back, and uh, we can accept that uh, change or not. Or if the governor vetoes the bill, we can come back and override them. Right. But you have to work with the, the Speaker and the President of the Senate have to work together. I mean, you have to do everything from scheduling your your committee hearings uh, yeah. at the same time uh, so that, you know, when the bills go from one chamber to the other, there's a, a time to, uh, to consider them, to working out pieces of legislation and getting agreements. Because again, if you don't agree, uh, nothing would become law. You know, speaking of working together, it was a couple of years ago I read an article uh, about Governor Schwarzenegger in California and how in the beginning of his term he couldn't get along with the Republican Party in the legislature and then to his credit he recognized that what he was doing is about the people. He reached across the aisle, he sat down and he found a way to forge a commonality with the other party. How's the atmosphere in Springfield nowadays in that respect? Well, it changed. Obviously, uh, I'll take some credit for that. We uh, had a dysfunctional government. We had a uh, obviously a, a governor who had been uh, impeached by the House. An hour after I got elected, we started an impeachment trial. Right. It was very divisive, uh, his term. And as soon as that happened, we came together, both Republicans and Democrats alike, decided on rules, which applied to the first ever impeachment trial. And we came up with a unanimous verdict, but we did it with some seriousness because we knew that what we were doing there was not just about Ron Bogoyevich, but about the history of the state and, and even potentially some legislator down the line that would be subject to an impeachment. So we did it, um, I think, in a good way. We did it, uh, you know, uh, as I said, uh, we started this literally after the same day I got elected. Mm -hmm. Five days later, I went to the inauguration of a guy who I sat next to for eight years as president of the Senate, so it was quite a week. Right. Uh, folks in, in uh, back in the districts, they don't want us to go down there and fight. Right. They want us to get stuff done. Yes. And they don't care what party you're from for the yeah. most part. And, and so we need to uh, sit down and work together. And that was my 
my philosophy. Now, sometimes, you know, the two parties do have different sure, philosophies sure. and you can't agree, but we, we've accomplished a lot of things in the last two years by working together. Uh, my counterpart on the Republican side, Senator Christine Madonio, she was also elected for the first time the same day I was, and she's the first woman to lead her caucus in the history of the state. So we've had a very good working relationship. And, and speaking of getting along, is there a common base of uh, issues that both sides identify as the problems that the uh, General Assembly really need to be addressing right now? Well, first and, of all, 95% so uh, of the legislation is stuff that you know f flies out unanimously, but right. there's a lot of um, uh, things that are worked out in committees and with both parties, and then you just don't have much controversy. Uh, the most important thing we do is pass a budget for the state of right. Illinois. How big is that budget? A, a budget is about $26 billion. That's a general revenue fund budget. Right. If you, you might hear people talk about a budget of $55 billion. Well, that's all of the other funds that we appropriate, federal funds and tax property, I'm sorry, uh, uh, gasoline taxes and things like that. But the general revenue funds, that's the money we get from our income tax or sales tax. And, and that's kind of the discretionary funds. Right. That's about $26 billion. It had been more. It had been as much as um, $29 billion. We've, we've had a tremendous drop in revenues in the last two years, uh, unprecedented in the history of the state. You know, I think as citizens, we always hear when we about these shortfalls, we say, you know what, the government's fat, let's get rid of these. If we fired everybody who works for the state of Illinois, and uh, what a big of a change would that make in our budget? Yeah, it's important to know that. Most folks, again, uh, we find up in the Chicago area, you know, they don't cover Springfield as well as they might cover the city council. Right. People know their alderman, they don't know their state representative right. or senator. Uh, the entire state budget is about 12% of what we spend. Uh, if you fired, as you said, every state employee closed the prisons, you'd, you'd only save, uh, uh, again, about um, a little three, over three, three, billion, three billion dollars. dollars right. So what we do is we actually spend our money in, you might say, six different areas. One, one of course, is the operation of state government. We also spend money on elementary and secondary education. Right. So that's school aid formula that gets to the high schools, the grammar schools. We also spend money on higher ed. Um, so those are, are, are three areas. The, the other uh, three you might look at is um, pensions. So we have an obligation to be the employer for five pension funds, and we have to pay money into that pension fund. You know, I've heard someone say that uh, where we started to uh, spin out of control in terms of management of our budget was when we stopped funding the pensions. We stopped funding the pensions way back in the early 80s right. uh, to the level that we should have. So right. we underfunded that. And you can blame Republican governors, it Democratic doesn't legislators, doesn't sides. matter. And to the point where we are the least funded of all of the pension funds in the, in the nation. Uh, we, we attempted to change that about 1995. We passed a new law that said you got to start paying kind of a second mortgage to catch up. Right. Uh, but the first 10 years were not much of a payment. So really, it was in 2005 where this ramp started going up, and that's why we have such big obligations. Mm -hmm. By the way, just to finish the rest of the state budget, the two areas, two more areas that we spend money in, human services. These are people we contract with third parties they provide services for people like disabled kids or seniors or or uh, uh, people who have addictions that sort of thing the state doesn't employ people we hire people to do it misericordia for example right. receives money they provide basic services for uh, kids with disabilities and then finally the biggest part of our budget is Medicaid okay. so Medicaid is nursing homes right uh, we have uh, maybe 65 70,000 folks in nursing homes in Illinois who are Medicaid eligible, uh, poor people who uh, uh, need health care. And this is a public uh, obligation. Uh, if people show up in an emergency room, they don't need money, they gotta be, they got to be stabilized. The federal government splits that cost with us, but health care costs have been going up higher than all other costs. So it's a huge part of our budget. And when, so when people say, why don't you cut the waste out of state government? Well, here's, here's the response. For the operation of state government, you know that 12% of the total, we already have cut so many state employees. We have 10 or 11,000 fewer state employees than we had 10 years ago. Right. We have the lowest ratio of state employees to population in the nation. So we really have cut state government. People say, well, don't cut education. We want more money for education. Healthcare, you know, what are you going to do? Kick people off of Medicaid, then all you end up doing is they end up 
few months later end up in an emergency room and it costs you more money. So it's really difficult to go through all the things that we spend money on and say, cut out the waste. Uh, it's very difficult. Well then, what do we, you know, the, every citizen, both sides of the aisle, we want to know what it is that you're going to do, you, a generic right. you, to solve this. You, right. you simply just can't tax people and continue to tax people exactly. without creating jobs or more revenue. How are we being innovative to, well, here's to what address we've done. that? First of all, we have cut. So the governor, Governor Quinn, and the legislature in the last couple of years, we have cut programs. We haven't grown any program we've gone through, and we've, we've given less money uh, for educational programs. We've given less money for uh, health care programs. We've cut some, even in spite of our ratio of state employees, we've cut even some more. And in the case of pensions, we passed a law which will uh, save us money over time by reducing the benefits for future hires. And we've done that. In fact, that bill alone would save us about $400 million this, this year. Um, and so we've been doing that. We've been cutting, and we've been not expanding any other programs. Uh, but it still comes to a point where you have to pay your bills. And right. we, are, we are in debt. And I read recently uh, in the Wall Street Journal that the state of Illinois has gone to Wall Street to seek additional uh, funding and to try to come up with asking the investment banking community to come up with innovative ways uh, for uh, revenue streams to be created. Well, Can you tell us about well, that? Well, we've been borrowing. We have to keep in mind that we have been borrowing. Now, remember, this is the worst recession in my lifetime. It's unprecedented for the states, and it's not just Illinois. Uh, virtually every state in the nation has dramatic deficits that they've never had before. Um, we also happen to have, there's about 11 states, there's 11, exactly 11 states that have no income tax. They have other forms of raising income. But of the other states that have an income tax, we have the lowest. Uh, we also have the state that has the biggest exemptions. We do not tax, for example, retirement income. We're right. one of only two states that doesn't do that. Well, it's over a billion dollars that we lose in terms of revenue. Our sales tax is on goods, not services. Other states have sales tax on services. The service economy is growing at a much greater, greater rate than the goods economy. So we sort of have kind of a structural deficit. As the economy changes, we're not collecting the money that would normally come to the state. And as a result, we have uh, a lot less money. I mean, the states that surround us all have higher taxes, right. even Indiana. We're, we're compared a lot of times to Indiana and saying, why don't you have a business climate like Indiana? Indiana has higher taxes than we do. If we had their tax rate in Illinois, we'd have an extra $5.7 billion every year. And we wouldn't have a deficit. We would be <laughs> maybe even giving property or some, or some more tax relief, tax relief, property tax relief back. Tax relief right? for the, a right. little bit for the people. Right. So, so that's, that's really what, what, now nobody likes to talk about tax increases, but right. um, especially politicians, and especially people say, cut the waste. But if they don't know what it is we spend the money on, uh, it makes it kind of difficult to have that intelligent conversation. Well, well, two different things, but related. One of them is that you mentioned education, and yet the Chicago Bar Association and other uh, parts of the profession are addressing the issue of civics in the classroom. We've cut that out. You're a lawyer by training. We're in a democracy. How can we, as a democratic society, not be educating people about democracy? How there, do we justify there, There's that? a governmental illiteracy out there that is is impossible to deal with so when you're trying to, well, uh, we have classes for PE. Uh, okay. Why don't we have classes for people to learn basic things about government? Correct. And, and, and of course, at the same time, we've seen a dramatic change in the way in which people get their news. Right. The media, the, uh, the newspapers are bankrupt in Chicago. The uh, media has become more of an entertainment. The, if you go back 20 years and see how much time they devoted to politics and the nightly news compared to now, so it's a lot less. So there's another problem in that we, we have a, a, a tough time trying to convey to people just basic problems. The other thing that's happening in the cable news, people are getting, uh, they're watching their own types of news stations, you know, uh, right. Fox News or MSNBC. Right. So when you sit down in Springfield and you try to work a deal, a uh, compromise, <clears throat> usually in the old days at least you could start with the same facts. 
like, <laughs> and then have know, different okay. views on the facts. But now you're even talking about different facts that yeah. makes it difficult. You know, one of the things that I don't think is widely known is the fact that there's a, a thing out there called the capital budget and what it does. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the past, we've had in Illinois the program of Build Illinois. Right. And, uh, you know, New York is suffering right now with a major problem with all their bridges. What are we doing to protect our infrastructure uh, here? Well, you're absolutely right. There's a big difference. A lot of people don't know this either, but there's an operating budget where you pay for you know, salaries and, and the like, and then there's a bricks and mortar budget. Uh, last year, in the, all of the states of the United States, there was a total of $39 billion in economic stimulus uh, passed to improve our infrastructure within the United States. 31 billion of that came from Illinois. Okay. We were the only state in the nation to pass this huge capital bill. And we did it, and it wasn't easy. We worked with Republicans, both chambers. We had to raise some fees and some, some taxes in order to help pay for these bonds that we're selling. But it worked, and it passed. And as a result, this last year, we had the largest road program in the history of the state of Illinois. You may have noticed over the summer and late fall even, that there was a lot of, a lot of construction going on. Right. That created jobs. The other part of that bill is uh, buildings, uh, schools, hospitals, water treatment facilities. That's coming a little bit s uh, slower, but next summer you'll, f you'll find a lot of work going on there as well. And, and we, we need it for two reasons. First of all, we had gone 10 years without any improvements of our basic infrastructure, bridges and roads having to fallen apart, but also it created jobs. And, and that's why our economy has turned around. We are starting to see, now we've hit the bottom, now we're starting to expect that there'll be even more, uh, not a reduction in revenue to the state, but a slight increase because of this uh, economy turning. What are we doing to bolster the <coughs> convention uh, business that used to be so prevalent in, in not only Chicago, but yeah. the Rosemont, the surrounding Collar counties? Uh, another big uh, uh, triumph, quite frankly, because it had been 20 years of, of fighting uh, there's about five unions that uh, represent folks at McCormick Place. And, you know, we, we did not not want to be an anti-union type of uh, approach to this. We sat down with the unions and we said, guys, look, 100% of nothing is nothing. Right. If You know, you got these work rules that ensure you all these protections and certain salaries and certain perks and certain work rules that benefit you, but it costs money for the conventioners the exhibitors, and they're not, they're not coming back. Right. There's a couple that have already canceled. So we have to do something. So we sat down with them, and we passed the bill. And we actually put in the law some changes to the work rules. We changed the uh, way in which McCormick Place and Navy Pier was organized. We actually put a czar in there to kind of be in charge of it, Jim Riley, for a year and a half. And as soon as we passed the bill, some of the unions reluctantly went along with it. Some didn't and actually picketed the speaker and myself. But the goal was to give them more work. And as soon as we passed that bill, conventions that were thinking of leaving announced that they were going to stay. So it's been a great success. It's a huge engine for not just the city of Chicago, but the state. We get money from sales tax, from income tax, tourism, money from not recycled within Illinois, but people from out of state. We have a hotel shortage, though, don't we, in the city? Uh, and part of the that? bill is going to involve uh, increasing the bonding authority for McCormick Place so that they can build another hotel right, right at, the, uh, at the site. Where does gambling fit <clears throat> in all this stuff? You know, we hear all the chatter about expansion of gambling, the yeah. racetrack, slot machines, and, you know, we could talk about the policy issues associated with that, but is there a real chance that we're going to have an expansion of gambling in you, Illinois? You know, first of all, I'm not a gambler. Uh, I don't. I don't like it. It's not uh, particularly the way I think we should, you know, raise money to pay for government. But people do like gambling, and people say, uh, "Why don't we have gambling in Chicago?" And I say, "We do have gambling in Chicago. It's called Hammond, Indiana, because right. that's where people go. People come, especially international tourists. They come to the hotels. They say, "Where we go gambling?" And they say, "Go across the board, the border." <clears throat> that's why we got so much money for the Skyway because people are, <laughs> we're, we're taking the Skyway to go to Hammond, Indiana. So. Why not have a casino in Chicago? I mean, it makes sense to me. Uh, again, not the to Bear not Daly's to, kind of always been. A, on one hand, he's been opposed to it. He's, other, he's for it. Um, okay. He's for it. He's just not. Uh, when you go to Springfield and you try to pass a bill, if the mayor says he's for it, then then the rest of the state says, well, what do we get out of the deal? Right, so right. you know, he's been kind of um, a neutral officially. But obviously, this city would make a lot of money. 
it's not an expansion of gambling. It's a it's a contraction of gambling back into Illinois right. from the people who are already spending money in another state mm -hmm. where we make none of the money. You know, uh, <coughs> new subject, if I may. Uh, back in November uh, during the election cycle, and I'm, I don't know how people feel about this. I know that... Uh, Every night I went to bed saying I'm sick of seeing these commercials where instead of people telling us why I should vote for them, they're telling me why I shouldn't vote for the other person. What about negative uh, you uh, know, ads I'm glad, I'm glad you asked that question because this is my first time of being the leader right. during a cycle. So here's what happens. We have about um, seven or eight races that are real close throughout the state of Illinois. And we all, in our caucus, raise money collectively. Some of the money is raised by ourselves when we kick in uh, for the cause. Then we decide to spend money on television commercials, be they cable or broadcast. And we do a poll though first to find out how do we persuade people to vote for our, our candidates. And I'd like to tell you that we list all these accomplishments, the pension reforms and McCormick Place and uh, maybe even the change in the income tax to help pay our bills. And we asked people, does that make you more likely or less likely to vote for somebody? And maybe because of this uh, governmental illiteracy, mm -hmm. people say, I don't care about that. I don't even believe they did it. What about those ethics reforms you passed? Ah, they, I didn't read that in the newspaper. They didn't right. even do it. Right. Well, what if we tell you that this other guy voted for a pay raise for himself? Oh, I'm not going to vote for that guy. And then that moves the, the needle. So the fact of the matter is you're trying to win an election and you're trying to put commercials up to get people to vote. And by the way, the people that don't vote, we don't care about them. If you don't vote, the, the guy who's trying to get elected, he's not going to, you know, he can't waste his money to talk to you. Right. So he's only interested in uh, talking to the people who are likely to vote. If, if a more uh, broader base number of folks want to come out and vote who are more well-read and more literate, then that would change that poll. But that's what you do. You look at the poll, and unfortunately, unfortunately, the negative campaigning works. The politicians would stop doing it if it didn't work. Unfortunately, it works. But why don't we, during the interim period now, during that three-year hiatus or so be, uh, between elections, if you will, or election cycles, we, the, we have public forums and we talk to the community about, we want to talk about substance. We don't want to talk about negativity. Try to change the world. Is there any effort ever going to be made to do the that? people who watch this show care. The right. people are they do. Wanna, and, they're, and they're learning. Um, the problem is there's a lot of folks, they're struggling financially. They don't have a lot of time um, for... Uh, for leisure, they, get, they come home, they turn on a TV show, and, and they don't really follow politics. And they, or they don't even decide, they, they, they're all politicians are crooks, they're not even going to vote. The only way for us to limit negative campaigning would be to have a mutual truce, where the, both sides sit down together and say, I'll tell you what, how about if we screen each other's commercials to see if we can bring some sanity back to this? I, I think I'll bring the other side's uh, leader here and maybe a couple, I'll I, see if I've I can already, get a pledge. I'll, we'll put together a pledge. I've already talked to her about it to see if there's Have a possible way of doing it. The problem is always the person that's behind wants to catch up. Yeah, and, we understand. You know, you know, uh, you've been in the legislature 31 years, two now as, uh, as Senate President, and, and I know enough to know you're an energetic guy and you have no intentions of going anywhere. Two questions. First off, where, where do you see the state in 10 years? And then secondly, what would you like your own legacy to be? Because I think they're related. Yeah, uh, they well, first be. of all, I think the state is, uh, you know, we have a great state. I mean, we, we really have a thriving uh, fifth largest state, thriving, uh, pretty well-based uh, economy with uh, agriculture, insurance, uh, Caterpillar, Abbott Labs, ADM, and we've got some ma major companies. We, we have gone through the toughest time the state's ever had. We've hit bottom, now we're, we're turning it around. We have great institutions, uh, educational institutions. We attract people, we attract tourists. Uh, it's a great place to live in, 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 in Chicago and other in, in in Chicago and other places. So we're very, should be very proud of our state. And I think it's gonna, uh, we have to make adjustments though. We have to make sure we get, pay our bills and get out of this, this hole. I think once we do that though, and we, and we make it a business friendly location, uh, we will grow the economy and that'll be that much better. There's certain things you can look at, I didn't mention this before, but workers' compensation, mm -hmm. big cost for business, one of the highest in the nation is Illinois. We're going to try to improve that and change it. 
the tax structure is going to be uh, uh, adjusted so that it's, uh, we can pay our bills, but at the same time we don't discourage anybody from coming here. So I think uh, I'm optimistic uh, about the next uh, 10 years. We have to, you know, we're going to get away from manufacturing. We have to be innovative and try to bring green technology, that sort of thing, to, for the new jobs for the next 10 years. As far as I'm concerned, uh, looking back on my, my career, you know, the, the most gratifying thing uh, that I've done is to pass a bill many, many years ago, uh, which was um, a real tough fight at the time. People would be surprised to know that. And that was to pass a seatbelt law. So I was a sponsor of the seatbelt law, the child passenger safety law. Before that, we've saved thousands of, thousands, of lives. Yes. We've had uh, the fatality rate is half right. of what it is, of what it was when we passed that. At the time, 15% of the people wore their seatbelt. Now, about 93% mm -hmm. of the people do it. So that's a kind of a nice thing to have. Um, to be able to say that you saved some lives. What are you going to do about all the crazy cab drivers in Chicago? Yeah, cab drivers are tough. That, uh, I'll tell you one thing that's crazy. <laughs> and we, one thing that is crazy is that you know um, we're never going to pass this. I can assure all those motorcyclists out there who don't want to wear helmets, you don't have to worry. I don't think we're going to pass a motorcycle helmet law. But as more and more people are getting killed in motorcycle crashes, at least voluntarily wear your helmet as right, the best exactly. you can. You know, one, one more area, if I may, and that is, again, going back to the election, uh, so much time and energy and effort is spent by the bar associations to evaluate uh, uh, candidates for retention, and yet uh, all the, there were four primary ones that were targeted as not recommended pretty widely uh, and unanimously, and yet they got retained. Is that something that the profession and the General Assembly ought to be looking at in terms of how we it's very, go about very this tricky. process? The whole issue of merit selection and judges is tricky. Right now we have elections. Um, uh, some people say, well, why don't you have somebody appointed? Why don't you have a Blue Ribbon Committee appointed? Well, then who appoints the Blue Ribbon Committee? Right. And so it, 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 it's always going to be a problem. But what we have to do is encourage bar associations to rate people uh, and get that information out to the public. Uh, before someone is elected right. in the first place. Okay. And, and in the case of appointments where the Supreme Court makes, it, makes an appointment or chief judges make an appointment when there's vacancies, we would hope they would have some kind of standard, some kind of a screening committee or whatever necessary to make sure that only the best uh, people are, are appointed. That would be a big help as well. Uh, and then finally, you know, retention. Uh, it's scary because uh, we, you know, 20% or 25% sometimes people want to vote no on everybody. There you go. So. Well, on, on that note, uh, we uh, have one of the best people working for the people right here to now, the, right now, and I thank you for that. Thank Senator. you very much. Thank you. Uh, Senator Collardin, again, thank you for informing the community about the General Assembly uh, and how the Illinois legislative body works together. Uh, I'm Robert Clifford. Thank you for joining us for this edition of the Chicago Bar Association's Justice and Law Weekly. Thank you.